I'm delighted to welcome onto the First Time Facilitator podcast, Marcus Crow. Marcus, thank you so much for being on the show today. Hey, Leanne, thanks for having me. It's lovely to uh, get out. It's like a dog that's been, you know, kept inside for too long. It's nice to get out and go for a run. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll get you, get you moving, get your heart racing on this show. Hopefully not exactly. too many tough questions exactly. for you. But for listeners, Marcus, can you please share a bit about your career story, pivots? That word is overused uh, right now. It is. But like, what, is. Are, what are some watershed moments that led you to doing what you do today? I, um, I got, I'm, I'm the youngest of um, three. I've got two big sisters. And uh, as, a, as about a 16 year old in sort of the late eighties, um, I was banging on about something at the dinner table and my elder sister said, oh God, would you stop talking or at least get a job doing it? And that comment, she doesn't even remember saying it, but that comment was something that stayed with me. And then um, in about the mid nineties, I, I wondered how do you get paid to talk when I hadn't done anything? I was 25. I didn't have an Olympic medal. I hadn't battled a terminal illness. Like I had no story, like who the hell would care or, or want to listen? And my other sister, she was working at Lever and Kitchen, which was the forerunner to Unilever in the day. And she just done a Rojan presentation skills course that day. And she said, you know, there was a guy running this course. He was known in particular, but he was lovely. He was good on his feet and he talked for a living for a day. And, you know, maybe you can do that. Um, and so like everybody in this industry, I fell into it. There's, you know, there's no 18 year old who says, when I grow up, what, I'm not going to be a doctor or a fireman or an astronaut. I'm going to be a facilitator. I don't think anybody has ever, any 18-year-old anyway. Mm. Um, and so a bit like that, I fell into it. I rang them up. I was a bit plucky and, you know, probably a bit stupid and naive and with that overly confident. And I got lucky. They just sponsored the Australian Olympic Committee for um, the Sydney 2000 Games. And so they needed to make good on a sponsorship, which was to provide presentation skills workshop and now to do that you want the cheapest thing you can find so enter the 25 year old who they said yeah yeah we'll take you you look like you could pull this off and and uh it was pure luck and timing and i spent the early part of my career grinding out presentation skills workshops to the people working for the olympics at the time in the in wow. the late 90s wow what experience yeah it was lovely it's very fortunate you know sitting there rehearsing presentations about uh how to get the world supply of shuttlecocks into sydney for two weeks or how do you quarantine the equestrian horses when they come from, you know, Northern Hemisphere and have to wait before they can get into Sydney? All that kind of fascinating stuff. It's good Very fun. Cool. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so that was the start. And then I met a guy called Gavin, who was out from the UK setting up a business in 1999. Um, and again, it was a happenstance cup of coffee. Uh, and that turned into a business called Oxygen Learning. Uh, which we later renamed as Fuel because we had a trademark conflict, which again was another lesson. Uh, and the Fuel business was sold to John Singleton's STW in about 2005. Um, and then that was a six year process. And then more recently, my co-founder, Chris and I, we set up um, 10,000 hours about um, seven years ago. So, and here we are, the time does get away. Oh, it really does. It certainly has this year. Time's been very different this year, actually. It's like gone yeah. fast and then it's gone slow, depending on, you know, what time of the month it is and what COVID rates are hitting. 10,000 hours, was that inspiration from like that Gladwell book, you know, Picking Up Mastery? Where'd you get it from? Yeah, exactly. Look, um, my co-founder, Chris and I, we're about three months apart in age and we were both having our um, 40th birthdays um, a couple of years ago now. And when we sat down and we went, hey, you know, do the maths. Have we, have we done our 10,000 hours? And you know, we'd been doing about 160 days a year on our feet and, you know, for a sort of, you know, at that point, about 17 odd years, and you kind of times it all out and you can't, not all of it is practice so much as just raw experience, but, you know, we did the maths and went, okay, we need a brand that's going to recognize wisdom as we get older. Um, and is this a job that you get better with, with age? And it isn't automatically, you've got to stay humble, you've got to stay curious. Um, and God knows we've learned that in the last few months. Uh, but it is at least a trade that you, you know, Tom Peters is 72, you know, Charles Hand is 80, they're running sessions, you know, so you go, okay, well, God willing, if you can stay fit and healthy, then, you know, why couldn't you do this craft for, for a lot of years? And so that's what was the idea behind the brand. And of course, the idea around skill acquisition, we're quite fascinated with how do you get good at things? Um, you know, we could talk about that in terms of facilitation. You know, what, what is it that we're good at if we're good at it? Mm. Uh, which is a sort of an open question we keep thinking about. Uh, and I would love to explore that. I'd love to. Well, first of all, if you can sort of cast your mind back, well, not your mind, but also how you were feeling it. As a 25-year-old, you landed this gig, you know, you were audacious enough to ask for it, go for it. What an amazing job. I, I had a quarter-life crisis at 25. I was, certainly wasn't delivering presentation skills for, you know, the AOC. So that's incredible. Um, how did you feel 
like, and, and were you prepared for it? Do you think as a 25, reflecting on what you know now, where do you think you were? I think, I, I think naivety can be useful mm. um, because it, you, you don't realize what you're biting off to chew and, and you just start chewing and then you trip and stumble a bit, but you, hopefully your competence arrives as you stay in it long enough. Um, I think I confused showmanship for quality, if I look back. So, so I was, I thought this job is a performance. If I'm funny, fast, quick, clever, then it will be a good workshop. And I think that's a classic mistake that presenters make as they move into facilitation, because the presenter is a piece of theatre, you know, it's a show with one actor in the cast. Um, but the facilitator is in a is in a dialectic, is in a, you know, a, a multiple party relationship. Um, and so that, looking back, I thought it was all about me being fast, quick and funny. And so I worked on doing that and, you know, one liners and jokes and ha ha and, you know, but I don't think I was anywhere near as aware of the participant experience and my responsibility in that. Interesting. And you do a bit of both. I mean, uh, you do keynote speaking mm -hmm. and you do the facilitation as well. So let's talk about that difference um, in terms of your preparation. You yeah, said yeah. that, yeah. Do you find, I mean, is it hard for you when you get into a workshop to then not throw on the one-liners and what's the difference between the two? That's, I guess, like I said, prior to recording, it's the reason I started my podcast because the only sort of podcast that was out at the time before First Time Facilitator was Michael Port's podcast, Steal the Show. And it was all about like honing that craft and memorizing the lines and blocking your movement. And I was like, oh, this is good, but yeah. I want to know with how to deal with that person that doesn't want to participate or how to create safe environments. So what's your approach when you go to the different two? Like, do you prepare in a similar way? I think, I think if you look at what a keynote is, it's, it, again, it's a, it's a piece of performance. It's a piece of dramatic art. Yeah. Um, and so if you think of it in those terms, the audience has very little opportunity to do much other than either laugh and respond warmly or tune out, I suppose. Um, whereas in a facilitation, the audience has a, has a whole a plethora or palette of things that they can choose from. They can tune out and laugh, but they can also get annoyed. They can get excited. They can get engaged. They can get conversational. Uh, they can get argumentative. Like they can do lots of other things. But but a keynote audience tends not to have that array of options, I suppose. Yeah. Um, which means you just have to know your keynote cold, um, you know, which is a rehearsal point. And then I think, as ever, with you know, great keynoters will tell you that they land them by changing, you know, three percent that makes it make sense for the given audience on the day, the actuaries at the insurance conference, the salespeople at the pharmaceutical event, whatever it is. Uh, and that makes the audience go, yeah, you really understand our world. And you know, that's often in, in keynoting, I think. And I think that's all everybody's expecting from you and by you. And I think if you're funny and relevant and then, you know, you're fine. But I think a facilitator gets found out if the audience goes, you're just rolling this out of the can, mate. This isn't, you know, you're not really here. You're just, you just press play on a pre-recorded piece of content that's worked for you previously. And I don't appreciate the lack of um, nuance and contextual sensitivity that you're failing to display by just, you know, giving me canned stuff, I guess. Mm. And it's funny with the title First Time Facilitator. So you've done this for how many years? 23 years? 23 years and a bit over 3,000 days of it when you, when you kind of add it all up. Incredible. And I'm sure you've never had an exact same workshop experience, right? It's all been something as different audiences, context, environments. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it can rhyme. It's that old line, your know, history doesn't repeat, that. but it can rhyme, right? So you might go, you know, there are, there are cohorts I've worked out that I really enjoy being with, um, that seem to enjoy my temperament. And, and then there are other cohorts where I've got to work harder to to be like what they're going to want to consume. And it's more effortful for me, I suppose. Mm. Um, but I mean, as ever, no, no two sessions are identical, um, but there can be rhyming rhythms to them where you go, oh, okay, here we go. We've hit that point where typically the group is now doing this at this point. Um, that certainly, you start to see those patterns when you get enough repetitions under your belt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And with that concept of first time facilitator and what's happened recently, so you're, you've got that experience, you've got those hours under your belt with face-to-face -face workshop environments. Mm. 
what's happened in the last few months, oh, it's longer than that now, about six months now, right? We've all had to move to online and it's been a bit of a leveler. We, a lot of us are just, we've got the skills for face-to-face and like, how do we make this online thing work? Yeah. How have you felt during this transition? Um, has that experience that you've built up served you? What have you had to learn that's different, that's new, that's been challenging for you, that's yeah. maybe got you out of your comfort zone? Well, I, so, so it's quite existential, right? So, you know, we lost, you know, 100% of our forward order book disappeared over 10 days. So, so like so many in this industry, it, people just cancelled stuff. They just said, well, we're not we've got to stop, cancel, close, you know. And then bit by bit, and most people have this story, things thought out a little bit and something that was going to be live, they said, oh, we'll do it virtually. And, you know, we, it sort of trickled back into our lives. But I think the thing that struck me was it was quite an existential threat to have your, your um, well, first of all, to realise you're a non-essential worker. That was one of the first things, right? Because I was looking around myself at, at friends and family whose lives were, were not only either as busy or busier. I've got, you know, medical, I've got doctor sisters and brothers-in-law and um, others in construction and others who work in social services, you know, they were flat out. So I was like, okay, well, I've just been kicked to the curb. Mm -hmm. So I do something that society clearly doesn't need, you might say. So that that was hard to kind of initially stomach. The second thing then was the collapse of your expertise. So I knew how to run a workshop with a room full of people and a packet of pens, a Bluetooth speaker and a and a, you know, a, a little bowl of, um, of those gilliments, right? I, I, you can drop me down in any one of those rooms anywhere in the world and I'll go, this is my environment. You know, yeah. like, a, like a predator in their, uh, in their, <laughs> in their ecosystem. Um, with your weapons of choice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And all of a sudden we were like, oh, what, what platform? You know, like everybody, we switched on our teams. We didn't realize we owned it. Um, we sort of turned that on and Zoom and, oh, we can't use Zoom. And oh, what about go to webinar and, and Adobe Connect and, uh, Webex and you know like all of us we're scrambling and then what about these new things and Crowdcast and TO and Toasty and you know we I think we probably tried too hard to know them all instead of practice on just being good in a virtual setting and then um, mm. be platform agnostic I suppose and we eventually got ourselves there but it was it was quite disconcerting to not be competent when you've built up a career where you've you've traded on the competence you've, you've gradually acquired year after year after year. Um, that was disconcerting. How did you, I mean, you got a business partner. So how did you support each other through that? Um, you're lucky you got a business partner, partner actually. Yeah. Cause it's, it's tough. Everything you've spoken about, I resonate with. Yeah. Look, I, look, I am very lucky. I've been very lucky business, but I've had two wonderful uh, well, three wonderful co-founders over two different businesses, and I, I consider myself very lucky for that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we're, we're the different model in the sense that, you know, Alan Weiss, for example, talked about, you know, the solopreneur, maybe that's a word you've used, where, where you know, it's, it's myname.com, and, you know, I'm going to set the stall out like that. And we went the other way and said, no, we'll set the stall out as 10,000hours.com, um, and Chris and Marcus will kick it off, and, and then we're going to bring other people in, and Al and Electra and Tash and Jenna and Josh and others that are in the business and it means now, to be fair, it's expensive. I mean, we're we're running overheads that require that, and of course, that's all fine in a in a normal economy, you yeah. might say. Um, and all of a sudden, it became you know quite challenging in this one. Um, but then we've had the collegiality of each other, and I guess it's an important phrase we use when you when you look at group dynamics, which is to outsource your sanity. So you <laughs> you, you, you know you you're going. I'm ready to scream or or, or hit the walls or or do something quite dramatic and I'm, I'm going to eat a bucket of KFC and two packets of Tim Tams and half a bottle of Bombay Sapphire. Um, and I know that's bad for me, but it's all I feel like doing right now. And if you can tell that to someone, not only does it stop you buying KFC, Tim Tams and Bombay Sapphire, but it, <laughs> um, it, it gives you a chance for someone else to say, yeah, doesn't that suck? Or, or at least to go, well, what about this? Have you thought about that? And, you know, there's also these things to consider and, and it, you know, you're going to need it from time to time. And, uh, and we've each been there for the other at different times. So one of us might be up while the other one's down. That's useful because, you know, we can level off. And then, uh, you know, I'm very grateful for the collegiate support through the, through the whole thing. And, you know, we're not through it yet. No, absolutely not. Um, but I actually yeah. had to write down that phrase, outsource, outsource your sanity. I love it. One way that I'm doing it, it without having, I mean, I've got friends and everything else, obviously hu- husband, all that. But um, even journaling I'm finding is just really great just to get the ideas out of my head. 
Um, yes. Yeah, everyone says it. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll finally do it. It's been very helpful uh, creating the, the COVID diaries that I've got. So what have yeah. you, yeah, so what kind of things have you, um, well, actually, before I ask you what you're doing in the virtual world to, to make it engaging mm. and to bring the life and animation and humour that you've got on there, um, how are you personally feeling about it? Because I guess the reason I got into this career myself is because I love yeah. being, like, I loved, first of all, being a participant in these workshops. Like yeah. you know, I was always the one like answering questions and like the first to participate. That's why I'm a facilitator because I just love it. And now I'm on these calls and it's like, you know, the same four walls, the same screen, like my neck's getting sore from looking at this, the same camera. Yeah. How are you feeling about have, being forced to like to do this? Look, I, I mean, uh, it's, I'm interested to hear, hear you say, um, uh, you know, your neck sore and all that. I think you know, there's a lot of incidental movement, probably in, in lots of people's jobs, but particularly in ours, right? So ordinarily, you know, we're, we're, we don't stand still, we don't sit down much, we travel. It's quite an itinerant, um, peripatetic, if you like, move, you know, occupation, lots of movement. Um, and now you and I are both sat, you know, sedentary. And in, in fact, we can't move because we'll wreck the shop. Right? We've got to actually stay quite still. Um, so I'm, look, I don't enjoy it as much, put, you know, full stop. Um, but saying that I'm glad we can do what we can do, yeah. I suppose. So, so the first part is sensorily blind, right? If you think about, you know, five senses, we see people, hear them, smell them, taste them, touch them, you might say. Now we might say we don't taste people, you know, in the, in a facilitation, but what happens here is we, you and I, we have the illusion of eye contact. I, I'm looking at you right now and I, I feel like I'm looking at you, but, but I'm not. Um, and, and so this is sort of this um, facsimile of intimacy, mm. um, you know, and you, know, you could be scrolling your phone as you're doing this, as we know participants do do that. You know, what if we're really honest, we've also done as well while we've been in a group session because we know they can't see, um, just like, you know, they know we can't see. Um, and, you know, those behaviours, if we did them in a live setting, I mean, they'd be considered gratuitously rude, right? You'd, you know, imagine somebody came in, turned their chair backwards because they're turning their camera off um, and then just sat there, you know, like, I mean, I've actually had that happen in a, in a, in a, <laughs> in a workshop years ago. It was a protest vote. He, he hated the idea of the workshop. So he came in, picked up his chair, turned it 180 degrees, put it down in the same spot, but facing the back wall of the room. And he just said, yeah, he said, I don't want to be here, mate, and I want you to know that. Oh, I don't know. Well, at least you, at least well, no, yes, I know where I stand. It wasn't passive aggressive. It was just aggressive. It was great. Well, so before you get back to the virtual stuff, what did you do in that, in that situation? Um, well, I think it's something I think a useful text for any facilitator is Stephanie Burns and her work on adult learning. You may have come across Steph's stuff um, is to, to take the participant seriously. Um, and so resistance is information. And so, you know, we often, a lot of facilitation texts will talk about, you know, overcoming resistance as if it's something to overcome, you know, like it's, it's automatically friction, it's automatically bad, it should be dealt with, washed out, ironed out, all those sort of phrases. Whereas instead, if you stand with resistance and go, it's information. Um, so in that instance, you know, we'd let him stay there like that. Um, and then I just walked to the back of the room to, as a, a, what I was trying to do was get in front of him, but I made it look like I wanted to gesture about something and and yeah. and then we talked about uh, you know well you know if we're looking at this from another perspective what would we think i mean i was sort of plucking at a phrase and he reluctantly stayed in the room like that's an achievement right now i think he stayed there because i think he felt he wouldn't get paid if he didn't stay in the room um and by the afternoon he was he joined the group you know so now that that, that could be luck that could be he got tenderized by being there for a few few hours in the morning um, but, you know, that's the joy of this craft, right? You, you get a chance to see what else have you got. So rather than go, bad participant, what are you doing? You go, um, and here's a useful belief, right? There's no such thing as a difficult group. There's only an inflexible facilitator. Oh, love that. Right? So then you go, all right, what move don't I have that means I'm stuck with this particular thing at the moment? What, what is it that's not within my repertoire of, of gestures? Um, that perhaps I should draw on now. It doesn't mean you always get an answer to that, but mm. if you think in those terms, it at least leaves you with a bit of agency. You at least go, well, maybe there's something I can do. You know. Yeah. So how, I mean, 
I get, I, I totally get that. I've been in situations where I've said, okay, what is, why is this not working? I've asked myself during a break and what do I need to do? Um, but I'll, and also ask the group that for their feedback too. And sometimes I feel like maybe I can't, maybe I haven't got the skill set or the expertise to be that flexible. Have, have you developed your flexibility over your 3000 hours to be able to cater to like scenarios like that? Look, part of it's just time. No, not to give you an annoying answer, but with time, you eventually get the edge cases where you get the groups, you know, that just by dint of exposure, you eventually come across situations that are, that are rare, you know, so I've had, I've had roof tiles fall in because the water was flooding the building at Johnson and Johnson in, in North Ride. So we literally had water, you know, not leaking, dripping, gushing, like, <laughs> like pockets, um, you know, in the middle of a workshop and suddenly facilities are in and the, you know, emergency and, you know, fire evacuations in Barangaroo, um, uh, you know, there's the various edge cases that can pop up, you know, a, a, oh, I worked with Jetstar, the airline, and then, then there was a terrorism event in, in Bali and they suddenly had to create a panic room, like not a panic room, a crisis response room. So I lost half the group next door, setting up an internet line to, you know, um, that, that part of it is, is just sort of time. But I think also you want to be reflective about it and go, what have I learned about that particular instance? You know, how do I, and that's why colleagues are so useful to go, okay, what do we do about people who turn their chairs around? You know, that, that's a form of resistance. It's quite a powerful display. And you just talk about that. You go, why are they resisting? What are they resisting? You know, because they're typically not resisting markets. They're resisting the political representation or archetype that I am. I'm an instrument of management and they hate management. And so therefore I hate this guy because he's one of their tools. Yeah. Thing. You know, that's yeah. a different way to think about it, if you like. Definitely. It's definitely important to reframe because I think, um, particularly in first time facilitator mode, like something like, like that might happen and it's taking it personally, like, oh, they don't like me. And then mm. that can really then affect your self-talk and then your confidence might waver, which then it's a very quick path to maybe even not self-destruction sounds a bit aggressive, but it's, it's that sort of that reinforcing feedback, but then it's talking to yourself and then that, I don't know, in your behavior, then you're probably not as confident when you ask the group to do things and that will play out. So yeah. that sort of separation of, and just remembering, okay, maybe, maybe it isn't me. Maybe it's this, this process, the way it's been set up, response to authority, all of that. Love that. Yeah. And I think, look, a, a useful line I was, I find quite is to say, Hey team, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like we're a bit stuck. Does anyone else feel that? Love that. Right. I'm not asking them to solve it straight away. I just want to let them know that I think we're a bit stuck and maybe the we in that sentence is me. I'm not sure where to take things next, but at least then I say, does anybody else feel that? And they might go, yeah, yeah. Kind of, we spent too long on that. We, I thought we we're going to talk about this and we haven't yet. So I'm a bit annoyed by that. Um, and what it buys you is a bit of time to regroup and think. Mm. Um, and also I think the group appreciates the candor because I think they can tell you're stuck. Um, but then they're just watching to see if you, what you're going to do about that, yeah. um, whether you're going to try and, you know, fake it till you make it and sort of blag your way out of it. Sometimes that happens or whether or not you're just going to, you know, whites the eyes say, Hey, look, I think I feel a bit stuck. We seem to have lost some of our rhythm. What do you think? Yeah, I think we have. Okay. Well, what about this, this or this? Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back and we'll do that. I'll set the room up for that. I'll see you in 10 minutes. You know, it's those kind of things that sometimes get you out of a, 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 a sticky bit I suppose. yeah the, yeah that's right um that liminal space yeah mark Bowden mentioned that on the rec most recent podcast he's like just ask like if you're not too sure if you're trying to read body language that's a really bad predictor because we'll go quite negative just stop yeah. and ask the group i think that's really great advice yeah. so um just a question when you're moving these events or workshops virtually for clients one thing i'm curious about is how timing has changed so first of all like my personal perspective if someone if we've had like a full day workshop face-to-face mm. -face and clients yeah. request that online like my I, I don't know if something's wrong with me but I'm like I do not want to do a whole day in front of zoom like I personally just don't want to facilitate that so I'll yeah. sort of push back with different ideas with timing and you know pre and post stuff what's your response to that how are you converting face-to-face -to, -face to virtual yeah and look like everybody we've tried some different things I mean I think you know it's funny I did a strategy session last week with a with a locked into pretty much an entirely locked down Victorian group and uh, and we joked at the start in the, in the preamble around, um, you know, ordinarily we'd be somewhere in the Yarra Valley or on the Mornington Peninsula and there'd be a vineyard out the window or a rolling surf 
you know, and we'd be having a lovely gala dinner tonight with some beautiful wine and, you know, and damn it, we're not doing any of that. <laughs> you know, we're sitting here in our bedrooms, cranky and tired and already on our 12th hour of Zoom. Um, but we certainly went, you can't pick up a two day event that was going to be held in a, you know, residential offsite and put it down on Zoom. Like that, that just doesn't work. And if you try to do that, you'll just continue to be annoyed about what's missing. If you, if you flip it and go, what does the virtual context give us that two days in Hunter Valley doesn't give us? Um, you know, so for example, you, you take your conference. For example, the mortgage industry are doing a good thing at the moment. They've taken their three day big conferency event that's normally, you know, shared it on the Gold Coast, gala dinner, comedians, bands, dancing, you know, you get it, the whole lovely thing, all the brokers, all the finance partners. And they've said, we're gonna do four Thursday mornings. So nine to 12, Thursday, let's call it the 1st, the 8th, the 15th, and the 22nd, right? So, you, so the broker goes, oh, well, okay, I just mark my diary out for the next four Thursday mornings, I'm gonna be at the conference. Now you would never fly to the Gold Coast four times in four weeks for a conference, that's a stupid idea. Um, but in a virtual setting, you go, that's quite interesting. Um, so bring that back to us then, you go take your two day workshop and you go, all right, probably doesn't need to be two days, first of all, so you go, so instead of it being, and the best advice I got in the early days was, Marcus, take your training day and break it into four 90 minutes. So at the start, you've got to get to 10.30 and then you can breathe and look at your notes. And then you've got to get to lunch and you can have another breathe and look at your notes. And then you've got to get to afternoon tea and then you've got to get to 4.35 o'clock. And if you see it as four 90 minute parcels, it was a little less overwhelming in terms of, you know, learning content. Because I remember when we were training facilitators over the years, you know, they'd, they'd been taught a two day workshop and he rang up at lunchtime on day one to say, I've finished the whole workshop. What do I do now? Um, which is a classic um, trap for a new facilitator because they, they think it's all the content and they've lost, they don't have the ability yet to tell stories and spitball with the group and let things play out. So they cover two days of content in three hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you come, you come to your online and you go, right, we're going to nothing longer than 90 minutes as a, as a rough rubric, maybe two hours at the outside. Um, one of the things about being off site is you've got one bathroom for 50 people and one barista for 50 people. Whereas here you've got 50 bathrooms for 50 people and you've got 50 kettles for 50 cups of tea. And so you can actually have a five minute break and it can happen. Like they can get the break done in five minutes, which is bathroom, cup of tea, biscuit, sit down. Um, so therefore you can do that more often. So you can say, all right, we'll go for 45 minutes, five minute break. And, and, you know, and I'll use funny times. I'll say, all right, it's 11.27. I'll see you back here at 11.32. You know, that's it. Yeah, that's I did the same check. thing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. People go, mm, and you go, well, you're going to remember, you know. Um, so that works. The other thing you can do is you can, you can have homework, right? So you can say, right. So we did a strategy session last week for four 90 minutes, like a you know, one-day session, but four 90 minutes. Uh, we said, right. So here's the first one. Okay, we finished that. You've now got a bit of homework. This afternoon, tonight, tomorrow, come back to tomorrow's one with an answer to this question which you can't really do in a live event. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can, you can send out a draft of the work in progress that they're building together. Um, comment on column one, Annabelle, um, Barry, you comment on column three, and Charlie, I want your thoughts on column F, um, and you're gonna come back tomorrow and we're gonna hear those thoughts. So yeah, that's how we've kind of variously worked with it. Um, when we do it, you do something where you say, I want you to go outside and have a look, you can literally say, go outside and have outside. a look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, lockdown notwithstanding, but you know, you can say, right, go and do some desk research, you know, and take take an hour or two to do that sometime between now and tomorrow, and come back with whatever it is you've you've surfaced. That seems to be what what most people are, you know. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, we're in a studio environment, um, and even Lee Sales on ABC or Peter Overton on Channel Nine, for a Sydney reference at least, um, you know, a newsreader and a, a journalist, for example, they don't sit in those studios for seven hours. You know, they have, and they have a staff of 10 people that are there to make up and glass of water. And, you know, it's an oppressive environment. It's hot, it's no natural light. Like it's, you can't work in that. For you, can't. you can't, you can't. You'll turn into Gollum. I, I think I've certainly turned into like, at the end of the day, I've walked out and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been just, like cramped over, yeah. artificial light, all of that. I love your ideas around structure and timing. I couldn't agree more with you. Mm. Um, at the beginning of COVID, I found it difficult to influence clients and like tell them like that was the way it was going to be. But I think mm. now people are like, they're, they're, people are all about reducing the amount of time they have to spend on these calls now. Yes. We're all motivated by that. So I think it's yeah. really coming back to like, what are the key outcomes and then how can we use that in between time? 
and I think it's important in our trade also to help our clients so that yeah. in the sense that they're going, help us, how do we do this? I need to do my, you know, I thought this thing was going to last four weeks and I just wait and do it, but it, it isn't, it's lasting too long and I've got a board report and I need a strategy, like, you know, I need a strategy pack. I've got to put it together. I'm running out of time. Um, but I know I can't do two days on Zoom. So what do I do? Um, mm. You know, so it's, I think it's on us to come to, uh, come to those clients with different ideas. Say, so, oh, how about this? How about this? How yeah. about this? Um, you know, all that sort of thing. You know, lovely things that can happen, right? So you can have the, the um, in this example, so the, you know, one of the senior execs is based out of London. You wouldn't fly him out for half an hour, but he can join for half an hour. So you say, right, oh, in the afternoon of day one, we're going to hear from chief executive in London who's going to join the call and talk about the five-year vision and all that. Now, you go, that's, I mean, you might say, well, we could have got him to dial into the live event, but there's something a bit nice about that, that he, he just dials in and everybody goes, oh, hey, pop, Zoom tile, there he is, you know, lovely to see you, hear a story, all that. Really agree, good. agree, yeah. But there are some definite advantages and, um, yeah. I love that you shared some of those ideas and I, um, I don't know if you saw Hamish Blake beginning of COVID, he was sort of yes. Zoom bombing. Yeah. I'd yes. love to get just, uh, I'm still waiting on a time and opportunity and a famous person uh, to just like have a meeting and then just have someone come in and orchestrate that. That would be super cool. Well, that could be you, Leanne. You might be that person. Got, and suddenly Leanne Hughes parachutes <laughs> into, the, into the session. Ooh, yeah. yeah. With her predictably unpredictable predictions. <laughs> yeah. Very unpredictable. Marcus, you've got a really good sense of humour. Is that something that, you know, you've just, you're just a funny guy? Have you worked, sharpened your humour over the years? Um, look, it's definitely yes to the second question. Um, and really? you, you, sh you sharpen humour by being unfunny. Um, you, you know, because you, you find out what works, right? I mean, that's why comedians, if you read, there's a lovely book, Little Bets, that talks about how Chris Rock uh, would, you know, goes to the little comedy clubs on a Tuesday night where it's, you know, $10 and a free drink to get in. And doesn't, he's not on the bill, but he just goes in the back door and then the, the guy hosting for that night says, hey, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a little bit of a surprise. You might know his name. It's Chris Rock. And he comes out with a clipboard. He's literally got a clipboard and a ballpoint pen. He goes, hi, guys, I'm just testing some material. All right, so we're in the cack shop. You know, why are these muffins so big? And he you know, does the bit. And, and then he says, what do you think? Is that funny? What about if I did it like this? If I, what if I reverse the joke? And he tests it, right? So if you look at that in terms of how do comedians hone their craft. Um, facilitators, I guess, get a chance with a live audience to try things. And you find out what's funny. You find out what isn't funny. Um, you do it long enough. You find out what used to be funny and these days is no longer funny. So there are some things, I mean, we would, you know, tell some stories because we kind of prided ourselves on trying to find the edge where it's, you can't go past and then just take half a step back. Nice. But, so that the audience is left there going, or. Oh, or, and you're kind of going, well, that's you doing that. I just sort of said this. And, you know, if you've gone there in your mind, well, you know. <laughs> Sorry, Jimmy me. Carr. Yeah. In, in a way, yeah. And, but obviously, Jimmy Carr. He'll go, know, he'll go. Well, A, he goes further. But B, you know that's the deal with him, right? You go, don't come to my room. Like, you're coming to my room. You know what I'm about. You can expect it. Whereas I think in our line of work, the reason humour can be so useful is they don't expect it. Mm -hmm. So, see, when you go to a comedy club, the crowd sits their arms crossed going, right, mate, you said you're funny. Be funny. Make me laugh. Mm. Right. Whereas when we go in, they don't have that demand on us. So if we're funny, they're delighted. They go, wow, I didn't expect to laugh while I'm at this. That's handy. That's a bonus. Yeah. Um, so I think it's quite a useful um, vehicle for a facilitator, provided it's not like anything, right? It can be a, it can be a tool to w avoid work, which you've got to watch that you don't get seduced yes. by the humour and in so doing, you don't have the discussion that needs, needs, needs to happen. Yeah, it is an interesting line. And, I'm, and just at the beginning, you spoke, spoke about performer. And I'm, I'm just busy reflecting on that versus like how much am I a performer versus facilitator? Like what's my ratio? Where, where do I sit right now? Um, it's really, it's a really good question to prompt us. And it's funny that you mentioned Chris Rock does that. I didn't, uh, when I was in New York last year, Jimmy Fallon, he does like yeah. every, uh, before every filming of the Tonight Show, he'll do like a live reading of what he's going to perform that night. And if the joke doesn't land, he won't say it. So he's just doing it every day before he goes live. Yeah, I think, I think they're so instructive. You know, they, they, what, what we see is the lovely curated bit that's perfect, but what we don't see is the ugly grind mm. that delivered them the curation. And I think that for facilitators is, is important to embrace the fact that there's grind to get to the good stuff. Yeah, 
you find that links into your, your 10,000 hours. Now, I just want to switch, switch the conversation because you've had, I mean, you've been running this, you've been doing different businesses, sold businesses, built businesses, done really well in business life, got facilitators that are working internally that want to start their own solopreneur business or consulting mm. um, agency. What would be your advice for people that want to do that? It seems like during COVID, which is like during the riskiest market, a lot of people are like, I'm at home. I've lost all the desire to work because yeah. the reason I love work was because of the coffees and the people. Now yeah. that's gone. It's just the work. And I'm realizing how much it doesn't really fulfill me. And now they sort of want to explore other options. Well, first of all, like good luck to you in, 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 the, in the bottom of my heart. Like it's a, it's been very kind to me. It's a lovely thing to, to do for a living. It's a very privileged position because you, you know, if you sell curtains for a living, well, you meet everybody's windows, I suppose. Um, when you do this for a living, you, you, you hear people's lives, concerns, aspirations, frustrations. It's quite a privileged position. And you get this sort of vicarious employment because for two days you work for the bank and for two days you work for the drug company. And then for another day you work for the insurer. And then next week you're in the government agency. And like you know, people would love to think that's incredible, you know, exposure. Yeah. So, so good luck to anybody who's having that thought. Here's a bit of a, well, my two cents of, I've thought about it. Um, if you're in an internal role, because typically what happens is they all do a spreadsheet because they know what they've been paying to get the vendor to come in and they know the cost, right? And they know how many days they got for that and they know their own salary. Um, and they've been doing a few workshops internally. So they say to themselves, all right, well, I've done, I do two days a week, that's eight days a month. I do that for 10 months of the year, that's 80 days. What if I could get half the day rate that I've been paying this vendor and they times 80 by half, and then they end up with this nice number like $160,000. And then they go, and all I'd have to have is a laptop, a mobile phone, a website, and some cloud accounting. And they deduct that and they go, yep, I reckon I can live on $120,000 a year. Is that roughly the sort of spreadsheet you made back then? <laughs> That's exactly, yeah, back of a post-it note or, yeah. yeah. Right, and, it's, and, and you know what? It's not wrong. It's, it's a good rubric <laughs> for going, right. Now here's the catch. The two days a week that you've been doing, you didn't have to find them. You had a customer that couldn't choose. The customer had to have you because you're the internal resource. And the market facing side of facilitation businesses is the bit you haven't experienced. Um, now you can get lucky. I've met a lot of facilitators who, and in fact, in fact, a common one is they leave their firm and then the firm hires them back to continue to deliver, but now just paying them a day rate. And so they end up going, God, I'm pretty much making my salary. I'm only working six days of the month, not 22. Um, and I've got time to, you know, go shopping and have a bit of a life and look at other things. So they have this lovely honeymoon. And then that project ends as these, these things all do, right? We don't sell retainer style work the way a, an ad agency might, you know, mm. for example. Part of the problem is that you can train them out, right? So that's one of the problems is you do the program and eventually everyone's gone through it. Yeah. Right. And so they go, well, it's done. So what's next? And so my, my cautionary advice would be for people going into it. It's one thing to love the craft in front of room and all of that. And that is important, but you've also, and I think Alan Weiss talked about this. You also need to think about the market facing side of it and going, who are my clients? Who knows me? What am I known for? You know, so if I've come out of financial services and I reckon I can do net promoter score workshops for financial services, customer facing roles, let's pick a, a little territory. And you might say, okay, good. Um, that's your space. Now you live in Melbourne. So you've probably worked for NAB or ANZ and you've done it there. Can you work for the other one? And, and or do you have relationships up into Sydney to get to CBA and Westpac to give, these are Australian examples for our offshore listeners. Um, but it's thinking about that market facing side of it. Um, because strategically the decision you have to make in these businesses is, are you going to separate the selling from the delivery? Mm. And are you going to employ the facilitator or are you going to rent them on a day by day basis? They're basically the two strategic choices. Um, and so for solopreneurs, they're saying, no, no, I'm going to eat what I'm going to kill. Right? That's going to be me. Um, which, which means you've got to be able to, you've got to be able to kill, right? <laughs> if you, it's one thing to do the eating, you've got to kill. You've got um, to kill. Bit love of a it. crass metaphor, but you know, you get I that. love it. Yeah. Um, that'd be my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of what Seth Godin said. He said, Oh, something about easy, hard and hard, hard. Something about consultancy. If you want to be a good consultant, the easy, hard part is being good enough to be a consultant and getting results. The hard, hard part 
is letting people is getting people aware of you and knowing that you deliver those results. That's the hard, hard part, the marketing. And I think you're right. A lot of people um, go into it. Uh, I'm a year and a half out. Uh, but I guess I've, my approach was always about the marketing and not leaving my corporate job until I had an audience and sort of lowering that risk. Um, and it's been a massive, in terms of personal and professional development, every single day, it's been the biggest learning curve. Yeah. And you never really switch off. You're always sort of trying to problem solve. Yeah, I think that, that, that phrase there, you never really switch off. I think, that, you know, facilitation is a lifestyle in, in, a, in a sense oh, that, yeah. you know, w watch a mother and a child at the supermarket checkout queue as the child grabs a packet of lollies and puts it on the conveyor belt to buy. And watch that mother deal with that with an audience of people watching that mother deal with that and she knows they're watching. Now you get to watch a little group dynamic right there, right? And, and so I think if, you, if, you, if this really gets under your skin as it has for me, and I think it does for people who stay for a long time in it, um, you, you're always thinking about how people do things with people. You know, you watch someone complain at the check-in counter because the plane's late and they, you know, don't you know, and you watch that and you go, okay, there's an example of interpersonal dynamics and what's going on for that person. Why might they be furious? Are they just egomaniacs or did they get a cancer diagnosis last night? You know, all those things are things you might want to think about as you challenge yourself to take in the tapestry of humanity. Absolutely. Uh, my most, most recent podcast episode was just sharing a story of a just a, a gym class I went to recently and what all the facilitation lessons I learned from that. And now like it's, it's so, it's so true, Marcus, like I'm, everything that happens in life now, it's either a story for a workshop or it's a something I can capture for LinkedIn. So it's either for the craft or for the content. Yeah. Um, spot on. Have That's a great on. way to think. Yeah. And then you don't have to worry about where's my next piece of material coming from. If you just stay alert to the world. Absolutely. So, yeah. Curate, not create. It's awesome. Mm, yeah. So Marcus, any final words or advice for first time facilitators, anyone listening to the show can be about business or delivery. Um, you've shared so much today. It, how would you sum it up? Um, sum it up. Uh, <laughs> well, let's maybe take the two pieces in turn. So on the craft and, and I'd go, see, you know, and I'd see it as a craft and, you know, uh, you know, we we're all humbled in the last six months as we were confronted with incompetence. Um, but if you take a craft approach, you know, your fifth webinar is going to be better than your first one. And so just like your fifth draft of your book is going to be better than your first one. So you've got to, you know, Ali, Annie Lamont is an author, writes about ugly first drafts or shitty first drafts. Um, so I'd encourage facilitators to go rather than wonder about the, the tool, the tech, the mirror, the mural, the, the toasty, the whatever, all these different things. Just log in, create an account, kick around with it, invite one of your friends to it. That's how you're going to find out if it's any good um, kind of thing. So I'd encourage that sort of craft experimentation. Just, you know, you sort of go, do I, do I try this? Um, you know, try an exercise. You know, it's funny, a colleague I had years ago, Ben, he used to say, I try and ask myself, what's something I can do in this workshop that I've never done before? Um, so it might just be taking an old exercise and doing it a different way. Um, but just, I think that's a lovely way to just go, oh, today I did it with them just sitting down. Or today I did it in pairs. Normally they do groups of four. Or today what I did was I made them watch a video before they then, you know, whatever. I think that's a useful kind of way just to keep the craft going. Um, and then for those listening that are they're on the business side of it, um, uh, I, you cannot get away from the market facing kinds of demands. And some of the inspirations that can help you there are the enterprise B2B salespeople that roll around on LinkedIn. And there's a bunch of them out there and look like everything. There's, there's some signal and there's some noise in what's being produced. But, um, you know, because they're, they're, they're talking to an audience that unashamedly is a sales professional. You know, so they, they get that I'm here to sell. Um, whereas I think for facilitators, they are reluctant salespeople. Um, when somebody says, you're going to need to do them selling. And they go, really? I don't really want to do that. Can't the phone just ring and they buy more workshops? Um, which of course can happen and does happen. Um, but you might want to in, in confront, not confront, you might want to embrace the, the sales disciplines of the people who proudly recognize themselves as being professional salespeople. Yeah, that's something I definitely got away from Alan Weiss. He was, you know, that line of you're not being shot at, so just pick up the phone. It was like, oh. Yeah, yeah. And, and or you, know, you make your approach. You might say, look, I saw. You know, imagine Leanne was, you know, the, the head of OD for clients I admire and want to work with. You know, hey, Leanne, I saw your recent post about uh, the challenges of lockdown. It prompted me to get in touch. You know, we work with client you would admire A, client you would admire B, client you would admire C. 
uh, doing thing you would like to solve one or thing you would like to solve two. What's the best way to put 20 minutes in your diary to talk a bit more? Um, something like that. Awesome. And you, Thanks for right, that complaint. Now you do that, but you notice how it's not automated off a bot, right? That's me writing to Leanne. I've got a comment on the thing that I saw that you'd, but if you did 10 of those, um, I don't know, four days of a week, that's 40. That's 160 in a month, 10 months of the year. That's 1600 bits of outreach. You know, anyone in the game will say that activity is productivity. So if, you, if you're doing those things, um, good things should accrue, I would, I would think. I, I, yes, I agree. I'm just writing down that one. Activity is productivity. You've given me so many. I mean, I know you said uh, it's not about the one-liners, but I've got uh, quite a few yeah. stacked up, written down in my yeah. notebook already. Yes. Marcus, if people would like to get in touch with you, find out all about the work that you do, where can we send them? Uh, well, for the business, we're at 10,000hours.com, which is one with four zeros, hours. Dot com. There's lots of ways to get that wrong, I've noticed. It's not the words, it's the number, 10,000hours.com. And you'll find me easily enough on LinkedIn. Um, I'm out there like everybody, you know, uh, I think we're all wasting our time and in about 30 years, we'll look back and go, what were we thinking? Um, but for the moment, it seems to be a game we're playing. So um, I'm, I'm playing that game too, like you are and doing it so well. And it's lovely to, to spend some time together and chat. Absolutely. Yeah. I love LinkedIn. Definitely hit up Marcus on there, comment on everything that he does, send him a message, let him know what you thought of this show. Marcus, it's been an absolute pleasure to connect with you on this one. Thanks for sharing all your expertise. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.